nearly every year. Yeah, every year, my wife and I discuss the same thing at after Easter. Probably mainly me, but she listens sometimes. Is she in here? Where is she? Um, the irony to me that Easter gets just, it's just less mainstream than, than, than Christmas. It just bothers me. And I, I've been trying to, I have different theories on why that is, but there's a strange absence of Easter songs, you know? There's a strange absence of, you know, we have a million Christmas movies, right? And there's an absence of those. I had a picture of them, but there was a lot of them. There they are. Look at all of those. I mean, that's just, that's just a sample. Most of them have nothing to do with Jesus. But, so why? You know, what, what is it? Perhaps the answer is commercialism. Uh, the depths of a very lucrative and profitable Christmas marketing campaign. And, and that, is, that is because I've narrowed it down to this, and I'm pretty much staying here. I, I believe that it's easier to market a manger than it is to market a cross in an empty tomb. Let's just compare the two. Jesus, a baby being born in a manger, the angels singing, the nativity scene, the, the, the red and the green and everything, or adult Jesus bleeding to death on a cross, political upheavals, opposition, religious and national empires disturbed and angry, and then a, a conspiracy theories and an empty tomb and a risen king. A risen king that still, at this time, to the, to the witnesses, to the hearers, and even to the followers, was not bringing the kingdom like they had hoped for. If he was only born, if it was just Christmas, what would that mean for our life? Well, a nice story. And we get to exchange gifts once a year and have some time off work. That's about it, if he was just born. If he had only born and died, well then, that was a man who did some pretty cool miracles and was willing to die for the cause that he stood up for. And he must have really believed the things that he taught. And we can take some good principles from that, apply it to our life, and become good citizens. But the fact that he rose from the dead, that changes everything. And yeah, this is, it's basically another Easter message. Matthew 17, 54, when the centurion standing there in front of Jesus saw how he had breathed his last, he said, truly, this man was the son of God. Changed everything. What, he, what Jesus said and what he did, his, his deeds and his words was real because of that, because of the resurrection, that means that our lives have to change. They have to change according to how he said they should. And that's part of the foolishness of this Christian thing, the belief system. It's not popular. In fact, this message is, is supposed to be offensive. The gospel message, it's going to be offensive. Even, even like we were talking about in Sunday school this morning. Even to within the church, it's going to be offensive to people, which is crazy to me. If it's preached right, it will be offensive. 1 Corinthians 1.18 in the GNT says, For the, the message about Christ's death on the cross is nonsense to those who are being lost, but for us who are being saved, it is God's power. So it's not popular, it's not easy to market, because if you have a cross and an empty tomb, you are bringing the idea of repentance in. The requirement for repentance, the requirement for people to change their life, their allegiance, ultimately. And being a committed follower is, is, is required. 
if, if that's the case. It's, it's not, so it's not just an audience hearing a story. And Jesus' life is not a story. It's actually a pattern for our life. It's a pattern for our death, and it's a pattern for our resurrection. And I'll break it down like this. The one who is spiritual life, Jesus, John 14, 6, was born once into the flesh, John 1, 14. He grows up and suffers and dies, Romans 8, 34, then to be raised into glory, Romans 6, 4. We, on the other hand, are born. We start out spiritually dead, all of us. And we have to be born twice. We have to be born again. Uh, Ephesians 2, 1, John 3, 3. Three, and grow up through suffering and death, John 16, 33, 1 Corinthians 15, 22, to also be raised in glory one day, Romans 6, 5. You see the pattern. This is the pattern for our lives. And what matters most is what we do between our second birth and our last breath. That's what matters most. We're born again to follow Jesus. And what is following Jesus? It's hearing what he said and what he did, and you're going to do the same thing. You're going to say what he said, and you're going to do what he did. His pattern for our lives, then, would be forsaking comfort, being untied to the world system that we're living in right now, being about the Father's business, telling others this good news somehow, some way, healing the sick, casting out demons, caring for the poor, loving our enemies, being involved in a kingdom community, and that's just to name a few, and of course taking up our cross and following him even if it's to our physical death. Now, that sounds way more than a nice story, and that sounds more serious than just a good teaching. It's, it, what it sounds like and what it is, it's a ruler, it's a king, and a kingdom that demands our allegiance. Allegiance, which is what repentance really is. It's, it, it's allegiance. It's a switch in your allegiances. If we really believe the Easter story, something has to come after. And hence the name of this series, After Easter. They, um, traditional churches call this the Easter t tide season, the, the 40 days, the 50 days. Uh, and that's where we are. But something has to come after. And we can learn from the events that happened after Easter in the Bible, just like these two witnesses on the road that we talked about, that we're going to talk about today, rather. And we'll start in Luke chapter 24. That's where we'll be this morning. So if you turn there, Luke 24, verse 13. Same day. We're, we're, we're right after the resurrection. Verse 13, that very day, two of them were going to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and they were talking with each other about all these things that had happened. Afternoon, night, whatever. I'm not going to get specific with times, just to give us, you know, debates. Um, Two people, uh, Cleopas, we, we, know, we know who one is from the context. We do not know who the other one is. We don't even know if it's two men. Could have been his wife. We don't know. The text doesn't say. All we know is they were walking away from Jerusalem. They were walking away from Jerusalem. So right off the bat, that's significant to understand what their condition was. Now, we... For back in verse 24-9, it says they're from all the rest. So they were followers. They just weren't one of the 11 or 12, but 11 now, right? Why are they walking away from Jerusalem? 
If I was in their shoes, the last thing I would be doing is walking away from the scene. I'd be camping out near the tomb. At least wait a few days, see what's going to happen. Unless I gave up hope, or maybe if I was Jewish. Because the Talmud says that the whole strength of the morning is not till the third day. For three days long, the soul returns to the grave, thinking that it will return into the body. When whoever it sees that the color of the face has changed, then it goes away and leaves it. So in other words, a lot of times, the, the, the thinking is, is that, well, after this amount of time, the, the soul is just going to leave, and there's no chance of it ever coming back or, you know, coming, coming back to life. That's what they thought. So if I believe that, I'll be like, yeah, it's hopeless. It's too late. It's gone. You know, the ghost is gone. It's, it's kind of like you're going to drive five hours to go see a solar eclipse or something, and then you get there and nothing happens. You just wasted gas money and some, I don't know how much those sunglasses cost. Probably not too much, but they didn't see anything. So that's why they're walking away. They're hopeless but they're still talking about what happened. So, verse 14, And they were talking with each other about these things that had happened, and while they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, What is this conversation that you're holding with each other as you walk? And they stood still, looking sad. The one of them, named Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only visitor in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in in these days? And he said to him, What things? And they said to him, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it's now the third day since these things happened. Moreover, some women in our company amazed us. They were at the tomb early in the morning, and they did not find his body, and they came back saying that they had seen even uh, seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the woman had said, but him they did not see. Verse 21 really reveals their faith because they said, we had hoped. Yeah, we had hoped that this was going to be. He was supposed to be the one to redeem Israel. And now we're left here to ourselves. He's been dead, I mean... (laughs) Three days, he can't be alive. It's too late. And those, you know, you know women, right? They're eccentric and emotional. I'm thinking in the Jewish patriarchal context. That's not what I believe now. Uh, But yeah, that's, well. Said they saw some vision and and he is alive. Well, we didn't see him. See, I'm sad. It's a sad day. How much longer are we going to have to wait to be vindicated and rule with our Messiah? Who can we even believe anymore? I mean, Zechariah said he, said he was going to redeem Israel. And Anna, you know that prophetess? Well, she said this baby was the hope of Jerusalem. Jerusalem's looking pretty hopeless now. In fact, I wouldn't be surprised if... if Not too long in the future, Jerusalem is just wiped out and the temple is destroyed. So Jesus responds. Verse 25, he said to them, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe all the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Just notice, he doesn't even reveal himself first. 
Because ultimately it was God keeping them from seeing who he was. So he doesn't reveal himself first. He actually points to the scriptures first. That's the first place he points to. And sound interpretation, because the scriptures, if they're properly uh, interpreted in context, they point to Jesus. So they missed they miss last week's message. They missed they miss Psalm 22 and surely Isaiah 53, amongst many others. Or else they would have known, yeah, Jesus has to, the Messiah is going to suffer, but he's going to be victorious. Because suffering is, it's a hard pill to swallow. For your, for, your, for your fearless leader, let alone for yourself. Paul understood this. He, he also had a visit from the risen Jesus on a Damascus road. I guess roads are a cool place to visit people. Acts 9.15, but the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. Suffering. These two witnesses on the road, they thought that Jesus was dead and not coming back. It's, it's, it's ironic. There's irony in, in the text because you have living disciples talking about a dead Jesus while a living Jesus is speaking to lifeless and hopeless disciples. And their weakness is also easily our weakness this morning. Because we can act like lifeless followers of Christ when we give in to hopelessness. When we doubt. When instant victory doesn't always come. Or when this following Jesus thing is not what we were told. And then what do we do? Often we demand signs that are never going to be enough anyway. The signs will never be enough when we simply have to hear his words and trust in the one who said it. Hearing means understanding and obeying. John 5, 24, Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but is passed from death to life. So, Jesus is rebuking these people. He doesn't rebuke them for not believing the woman. He doesn't rebuke them for not, you didn't believe the evidence? You see all these miracles and signs that I've been doing? He actually rebukes them for one thing. He rebukes them for not believing the scriptures in the context that they were written in. And then you have grace manifest right there because he could have left them. Luke 24, 27, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. You have the word made flesh interpreting the word. Best sermon ever. It doesn't get any better than that. It could have, well, it's about a three-hour journey. Yeah, it could have been a long sermon. And they didn't want to let him go. And they still don't know who he is yet. But there was something special. Maybe there was hope beginning to stir. Maybe this is what all this preaching and teaching stuff is all about. So after they hear from this apparent stranger, they probably had some more questions. And then we go into verse 28. So they drew near to the village to which they were going. He acted as if he were going further, but they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is now far spent. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took the bread and blessed it, and broke it, and gave it to them. And their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, 
Did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road? When he opened up to us the scriptures? And they rose and that same hour and returned to Jerusalem and they found the eleven and those who were with them gathered together saying, the Lord is risen indeed and he's appeared, oh, I'm sorry, let me back up. The Lord is risen indeed and he's appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of the bread. So they invited Jesus. In fact, they strongly urged him, the word says. Stay with us. So he stayed with them. And then he went to the table with them. And Luke, you know, every word... When you're reading scripture, don't for a second think that these things are just thrown together. Like, oh yeah, you thought it'd be a good idea to just throw this here and throw this there. This is divinely inspired. There's purpose in the writing. There's purpose in the literary devices. So Luke's driving with this with, 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 three times. He uses the word with, with purpose. The word for with means remaining, remaining around, but the focus of the word is on the associative aspect. It's not like, hey, I'm here with these guys over here. We're in, we're in a building. You know, we're with each other, but we're not with you. You know what I mean? It's, it, there's an association there. Uh, there's fellowship. That's what fellowship is. That's what community is supposed to be. And it's, a, it's another, it's a prequel, a foreshadowing to what's going to happen in the upper room and the establishment of the early church. They're with each other. Not, not just in the same room, but they're actually associating with each other, sharing life. Because these two witnesses were about to go from just knowing about Jesus to knowing him. And there's a huge difference. You can know about Jesus all day long. You can go borrow 10 of my theology books. Go for it. You can get a lot of knowledge. Or you can be with him. And you can know him. Which would cause you to want to follow him. And I don't know, maybe do something crazy like lay down your life for him. Like die. Die. But how can you really follow someone if you don't know and trust them? How can you know and trust someone just by knowing about them, but never being with them? I know a lot of fans of celebrities. You know, like fandom wiki. Hold on, let me translate the geek instead of the Greek. For once. A wiki is a website controlled by users. So Wikipedia, not the most trustworthy. The users are pulling together and editing that. So a fandom is a subculture composed of fans. It's usually of fictional characters. And uh, celebrities that you're never going to meet. So you could be the biggest Trekkie in the world, but you're never going to actually sit with Captain Picard on the Enterprise, right? Plus, he's a fictional character, and Patrick Stewart is really old right now. So, um, and he's not actually that character. So he's, he's somebody else. I don't, I, don't, I don't know him, so I don't know. You can be, hey, the biggest Iowa Hawkeyes fan in the world, but you're probably never going to get to know Caitlin Clark. Maybe some of you do. It's a small, I mean, it's highly unlikely, Right? But we sure know about it right now, right? The living God and the creator of all the universe, he wants way more than a celebrity. He wants to be with us and dine with us and fellowship with us. So it's about being with him just like with these, with these two witnesses. Something awesome happens when we finally understand this. So 
Notice before they knew who he was, what happens. So he, he sits down, he comes, he's in, he's in their, their home, which leads many to believe it was a couple, right? So he's in their home. He takes bread, he blesses it, he breaks it, and he gives it. And we see that fourfold pattern in, in three places in Luke. We find it in Luke 9, 17, when he fed the 5,000. Then we find it in twenty two nineteen 19, at the Last Supper. And that moment kind of looks like It wasn't like an official communion moment, but it looks similar to the sacrament that we have. And then this kind of sounds familiar. It sounds like another story that Dr. Luke writes about in Acts 8.26. And there was an Ethiopian eunuch who was leaving Jerusalem, going to Gaza. He's reading Isaiah, doesn't really understand it. God sends Philip. The eunuch invites him into the chariot. And Acts 8.35 says, Then Philip opened his mouth, and beginning with Scripture, he told them the good news about Jesus. And as they were going along the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, See, here's water. What prevents me from being baptized? And he commanded the chariot to stop. And they both went down into the water, Philip and the eunuch, And he baptized him. And when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord carried Philip away, and the eunuch saw him no more and went on his way rejoicing. That's exactly what those two did. They rejoiced by spreading the good news. You bet you that eunuch is going to spread some good news. But just like Jesus disappeared after a fellowship meal, his messenger Philip now disappears after the baptism and the mission is continuing. You see what this church stuff is all about, why we do what we do, why we have baptism and communion. Sharing tables together, fellowshipping with not only each other, with with his spirit. And that's because he's still with us. This is the church. We may, not, we may not see him, but that doesn't change the fact that he is still in the midst of us listening to our conversations. He's listening to what we talk about. The book of Revelation says that Jesus walks in the midst of the lampstands. The lampstands are the churches. He's walking among us. He's he's listening. And sometimes he's questioning. What are you guys talking about? What are you, what, what? Imagine us talking and, and, and he's here, his spirit is here. And then us not recognizing him because we've misinterpreted the Bible, us becoming hopeless because it's not what we expected. Imagine being called slow of heart and foolish. But if we understand the scriptures, we can recognize his presence. We can invite him in. Revelation 3.20 says this, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and eat with him and he with me. So we're either on the road just talking about him or we're at the table dining with him, feasting on his word and telling other people about it. Or... We're in the chariot reading about him and not really understanding what all this is about. Or we're getting in the water like baptism, what baptism should be about. A change of allegiance, repentance, following his actions, and then going out and doing the same thing that he did. The change in both those two is understanding the scripture. It's the word of God. Today, you can go from hopeless 
to real fellowship with the Lord Jesus? How about going from how about going from just just knowing a lot about him? Carolyn, come up please. Just knowing a lot about him, being really really excited about being a Christian. How about going from that to understanding and following him wherever he goes? I'm talking about saying the things that he said and doing the things that he did. And my question this morning is, for some of you, not all, right? Because it's the spirit ultimately. What are you waiting for? Why are you still walking on a road away, away, when you should be working towards him? He already knows what you're thinking. He already knows your conversation. He knows how hopeless you feel. He knows how hurt you may be. He knows what they did to you, what they said about you. He knows the pain that you're in, the physical pain, the mental pain the anguish and all of it. It's, it's building and you're walking and you know this, I see this. He said uh, peace that surpasses understanding and uh, fruits of the spirit, gifts of the spirit. Um, he's going to provide for me. Um, he's going to walk with me. He's going to talk with me. Send his spirit to guide me and lead me and, and protect me. And we're talking about all these things. And he's here in the midst of us right now, right this morning. His spirit, not physically here. We don't have that, that, um, I I don't even want to call it a luxury because perhaps it's not. Do you think seeing him physically changed the stubbornness of their hearts? It was an encounter with who he really is. What kind of God we really serve. And all he wants to do is go from being unrecognized to recognized in who he is based on his word. To cause people in reaction to that not to just continue to talk about him, but to talk with him and be with him and then go out and from that you're telling other people. And your life is basically never the same because it's all about Jesus. We live in a time where we know a lot of stuff. We live in a time where Christians know a lot about end times things. Jesus, the gospel, the Bible. And we'll spend hours, hours debating over Calvinism and Arminianism and uh, infant baptism and this and that and, and tongues and, and all the things. And Jesus is like, what things? Come and sit with me. Let me show you what this is really all about. Because there's, there's things coming. There's, there's stuff coming. It's been happening since, since that day, since Resurrection Day and beyond that you're not going to be able to handle and you're going to give up hope. And you have to learn to abide in me and with me and not only that, with each other. Because two is significant, obviously. It's just more confirmation. We don't think like that, but it's in our courts of law. Two witnesses for sure just makes it, makes it two or three witnesses. Yeah, that really happened. They really walked with Jesus and he really disappeared. This morning, just, I don't know, maybe close your eyes. We got some time. Maybe close your eyes and 
just imagine. You know, we have great imaginations. It's the creative God who gave us this imagination. Would you imagine this morning that Jesus is right here? Would you just imagine that he's sitting in the front row? Would you imagine that he's, he's getting up and he's, he's walking aisle by aisle right now? Touching your shoulder? Whispering in your ear? Just giving you a hug and holding you, telling you, it's, hey, I'm right here, it's going to be okay? Inviting you? into a deeper walk and relationship with him that goes beyond a road and it goes to a table of fellowship. It goes beyond being a fan dumb of Christianity to being a kingdom people who walk in a dominion that has already started. And he wants to rule your heart. And he's so patient that's why he doesn't really get tired of waiting because he's way more patient than us. But there comes a point where how much longer is he going to have to wait? This morning, it, it, it's time to get off the road. It's time to get in a deeper relationship. It's time to be with him and stop just knowing about him. Believer, for unbeliever this must be real because you're here you're still here because something is burning within you those those two witnesses had a burning in them their heart because God works with our emotions and you have that feeling like yeah yeah this is uh I feel like he's talking to me right something's burning within me I feel a little tingly sometimes. I love it when that happens because, you know, we like emotions. They feel good. It's going to feel good when, you know, Iowa wins the game later, right? We're going to be excited about it. But are you excited about following Jesus for the rest of your life? And that's what the commitment is this morning. And, and by God's spirit and his grace, he's, he's arranged that opportunity. So if this morning you would like to just follow Jesus, change your allegiance, change your allegiance from who you were to who you are in his kingdom. The idea of who you were, your past, your allegiance to your past, your codependencies, that relationship that you think well, you can't, you need to have it and it's going to make you whole. Guess what? If it's destroying his kingdom work in you, it's not going to make you whole. And you need to seek after him. And the only way you're going to know his will for your life is by knowing the word and dining with him and abiding with him this morning. If you're tired of life as usual, if you're tired of walking away from what was promised, thinking it's still not promised you, perhaps a disappointment of, I don't know, missing out on an eclipse, it just feels horrible. I don't know what it is. Just ask you this morning, would you just stand to your feet this morning if you're ready to follow Jesus? In fact, I say, some of us, we need to go back to Jerusalem. We need to go back, which isn't a place. It's not physical. Actually, it was wiped out, right? AD 70, sure, significant event. He's calling us back. He's given us time. And this morning, we're going to take time to enter into his presence. We're going to go back into worship. I don't know, maybe about 15 minutes. And I encourage you, listen. God does work with emotions, okay? That stirring in you is, 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 is that touch on the shoulder. It's that whisper of the spirit. And this altar... Now, you may, you may blast me for this after service. I really don't care. It is actually no more holy than the parking lot outside. Okay? It's just a place. The holy place is you. The temple is us, the body of Christ. But we...
we like things and we like symbols and we like objects. And all through the Bible, they use symbols to associate us with something deeper or greater. And in this case, this morning, this altar will be a symbol for you. And if you'll respond and come and seek after him, with the only expectation is that he's here because he is. So that expectation is fulfilled. Just come and, 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 and seek after him with your whole heart. Follow after him with your whole heart. And he promises. He already promised that he'd be with us. He already promised that he's here. He's still risen. As we worship this morning, will you do something radical? Will you step out of your seat?